The first time facing a regular expression can be a daunting experience. Like a dark art, they promise the ability to find and extract complex patterns in text, but their terse and almost mystic syntax can leave a programmer confused and anxious. Even the most experienced developer, having learned all the secrets of the regex craft, might turn them to a problem only to discover subtle edge cases that show the problem was more complex than they first thought. There's really nothing magical about this technology, and today we're going to pull back the curtain on regular expressions by building a simple model of a regular expression engine from scratch without any external dependencies. Our engine will be able to take a regular expression like this, along with an input string like this, and give us a true or false value of whether or not our input string matches the regular expression. Now, for the sake of brevity and getting to the essence of the problem, we're not going to be building a standards compliant, feature complete implementation. Instead, we'll build an implementation with a subset of features that I think allow us to get to the essence of how regex works. In our regular expressions, we can specify elements like literals that can be specified with alphanumeric characters and symbols that don't have any special meaning, the dot character, which represents a wildcard, and we can use parentheses to create groups of elements that are treated as a single element in the regular expression. And if we need to catch a symbol with a special meaning but as a literal, it can be escaped with a backslash. Then we have three quantifiers that can specify how many of each element should be captured. The question mark can be placed after any element and tells the regular expression engine that matching this element is optional. The star character, which tells the regular expression engine to match zero or more of the element. And the plus character, which is just like the star, but instead tells the regular expression engine to match one or more of the element. You'll notice that familiar constructs like ranges, negations, alternations, lookaheads, etc. are missing. But understanding how our basic features work will make implementing these other constructs fairly straightforward, and they will be left as a very real and very interesting challenge for the viewer. The last assumption that we'll make for now is that all of our regular expressions implicitly start with the caret symbol, which states that the regular expression should begin matching from the beginning of the input. Again, once the core principles are understood, removing this constraint shouldn't be terribly complex. Now, the first thing we're going to need to be able to do is take our regular expression string and parse it, turning it into a data structure that we can work with programmatically. In the past, on this channel, we've used parser combinators to tackle parsing tasks, since they're extremely composable and intuitive. And there is a whole series on this channel about building a parser combinator library, as well as using them more practically for building the assembly language in the virtual machine. But regular expressions are so simple in syntax that we can pass them just by looping over all of the characters and building up a stack of results. So we're going to use that approach instead. We'll start with a file called parser.js in our project directory and create a function called parse. Parse will take a regular expression string re and what we'll end up returning is an array of states that will be used to process an input string. In essence, what we're going to do is iterate through every character of the regular expression and generate or modify a state. Let's create an i variable to represent the current index and set up a while loop where we can iterate while i is less than the length of the regular expression. The next character to be processed is whatever is at that index, and we can switch on next to process each possibility. For example, in the case where we have a dot, that's our wildcard and we'll need a state which can capture exactly one of any character. Not only that, but we'll need a place to store these states. And we could just create an array up top called states, but because we have to pass groups, which basically represent sub-expressions inside the regular expression, we're going to have to have some notion of a stack, because wherever there is recursion, there is always a stack in the background. Now, we'll dive into the details of exactly how this works when we start processing the groups, but for now, our stack will be an array that collects up state arrays, initially starting out with a single empty array. To make life a little easier, we'll also create a function called last, which just gets the last item in an array, which will always represent the top of our stack. Now that we have somewhere to place our results, we can push an object into the current state array, whose type is wildcard, and whose quantifier is exactly one. 
After incrementing the index variable by one, we can continue back to the top of the while loop. We also have the quantifiers, which affect how many times the previously specified element should be matched. For example, in the case where we have a question mark, the previous element should become optional, or put another way, we should match it zero or one times. We need to get the last element in the last array of the stack and check that A, we actually got an element, and B, that element hasn't already been quantified. The first condition checks that a regular expression or group doesn't start with a quantifier, which would be invalid. The second condition makes sure that these kind of regexes aren't allowed. As a little note here, some of these combinations are actually valid quantifiers, but again, for the sake of only getting to the essence, we'll skip over those for now. But provided neither of our two constraints were broken, we can simply modify the quantifier property of the last element to be zero or one, increment the index, and continue back. In terms of parsing, it's a very similar story for the star, so we'll copy and paste the question mark case below. The star represents matching zero or more times, and we can just reflect that in the quantifier. Finally, the plus represents matching one or more times. Now, we could implement specific logic for this case in the engine, but if you think about it, matching an element one or more times is actually just the same as matching it exactly once and then matching the element zero or more times. So first we'll just leave the quantifier as exactly one, but then we can create a copy of this object, changing the quantifier property to be zero or more. After that, we just need to push our new state into the last array in the stack and we're done. With those three quantifiers covered, we can implement the grouping logic. If we encounter an opening parenthesis, then what we're gonna to need to do is push a new empty array onto the stack. This array will now be the one used to collect up results as we're passing. After incrementing the index, we can continue and create a case for the closing parenthesis. In this case, we're gonna to need to create a group element state and include all of the substates that have been built up so far. To get those states, we just need to pop the stack. But first, of course, we actually need to check that there is more than one item left on the stack. A stack with just one item represents no nesting at all. Two items indicates that we are one level deep inside a group, and three indicates two levels, and so on. If there aren't enough states, we can throw an error pointing the user to the correct index in the regular expression. Then we just need to push an object into the last states array of the stack, whose type is group element and whose quantifier is exactly one. And of course, we'll be keeping track of all those substates. As before, we'll increment the index and continue. Now, the last explicit character that we'll check for is the backslash, which will allow us to specify that we really want to match an opening parenthesis character or perhaps a star without invoking the special behavior of that character. So we need to check that we have at least one more character left in the string. And if we don't, we can throw an error saying that this is a badly escaped character. Then we'll need to push an object into the last states array of the stack whose type is element, and whose value is whatever the next character is, and whose quantifier is of course exactly one. At the end, we need to increment the index by two to account for the extra character, and then we can continue. Lastly, in the default case, where we get any other character that isn't one of the special cases above, we'll push an element state whose value is this character. That covers all the features we'll be implementing here, and so when this while loop finally ends, we can return all the states that we've built up. As a sanity check, we need to make sure that there is exactly one states array left in the stack. If there were any more, that means that the regular expression contained groups that never closed. In that case, we'll throw an error. Otherwise, we can return the only element left in the stack, and at the bottom of this file, we can module export the pass function. So let's actually try to pass an example regular expression to check that it's working correctly and to see the structure that we've been defining. We can use the inspect function from node to pretty print the structure for us into the console. For our regular expression, let's use something like this. We'll console log the result of passing this regex. And when we actually run this program, 
we see that we get an array of states as expected. In the first state, we match exactly A, zero or more times. In the next state, we match a group exactly once that has a literal B exactly once, a wild card zero or more times, and a literal C exactly once. Of course, in our regular expression, we specified this group with a one or more quantifier, but our parsing logic splits elements with this kind of quantifier into an exactly one and a zero or more. So we see the following state is exactly the same, but with a zero or more quantifier this time. And finally, the last state is literal D matched exactly once. Now we've turned our text into a structured representation that we can work with programmatically, we need to turn our attention to implementing the actual logic of the regular expression engine. We'll start a new file here called index.js and create a function called test. Test is going to act like the test method on a built-in regular expression, giving us back a boolean value for whether or not the provided string matches the regular expression. We'll have this function take a set of states as input, the same set of states that we got from parsing, as well as a string. And we'll treat this set of input states like a queue, where we make our way through every state, progressing through the string. And if we make it all the way to the other end, then we know that our string matches. To create the queue, we'll make a shallow copy of the states array with slice. Just like when we were parsing, we need to use an index variable to keep track of where we are in the input string. We'll also need a variable to keep track of the state which we're currently processing which we'll just call current state. The shift method both mutably removes and returns the zeroth element from an array. And so we can use that to get our starting state. For our iteration, we'll use a trusty while loop where we keep going as long as we have something as a current state. We'll process each element with a switch statement, choosing how to proceed based on its quantifier and its type. Switching on the quantifier, if we're dealing with exactly one of something, we need to ensure that it definitely matches. If it doesn't match, we'll consider this to be a failure. To actually check that a state matches the input string at a given index, we can write a function that handles all the different ways that that might happen. This function will take the state, the string, and the index as arguments, and return information about whether it did indeed match, and how many characters were matched. First, we'll check if the index is outside the bounds of the string. If it is, we can just return an array with false as the first element, indicating that we did not match, and zero as the second, indicating how many characters were consumed. Otherwise, there are three possible types of elements that could be matched. The first is a wildcard, and that's easy because wildcards always match. So in this case, we'll simply return an array with true and one as the elements. The next type is an element, and for this, we actually need to check that the literal in the state actually matches the character in the string. So in this case, we're gonna test for the match and return the same kind of array, passing our computed match as the first element and either one or zero, depending on whether we did match. The last type that could be matched is a group element. In order to check that a group element matches, we need to check that all of its substates match from this point onwards. And that's actually exactly what our test function already does. So at this point, we're just going to return a called test with all the substates and the string starting from the position that we're currently up to. For all of this to work properly, of course, we also need to make sure that the test function returns an array with a Boolean match as the first element and the number of characters consumed as the second. If the type was anything else but these, we'll throw an error. Now we can scroll back down to the test function and actually use our newly written state matches string at index function. We can destruct the is match and consumed properties from our call to state matches string at index and check if we've got a match. If we didn't, we'll return an array with false and the current index. Otherwise, we'll increment i by the number of characters that were consumed and shift the queue to get our next state. Then we can continue back to the top of the while loop. If the quantifier is zero or one, it means that this element is optional. That means that even if we find the end of input here, we should just consider that to be a match and move on to the next state. If we didn't get the end of input, then we can use our 
state matches string index function again to see how many, if any, characters are captured. Whatever number we got, we can add to i, and then we can shift a new state and continue. The last quantifier, zero or more, is going to be quite similar, but the difference is going to be that we need to keep trying to match characters as long as we can, so we can actually use another while loop for that. It's good to note that a while loop within a while loop can easily get pretty hairy, so whenever you're writing these, you'll want to make sure that the code inside is as clear and straightforward as possible, and also make sure that you've covered your exit conditions properly. Just like with 0 or 1, if we reach the end of input, that's okay. We'll just shift the next state and break. We don't use a continue here because we want to escape this inner while loop. Then we can check for our match. If it's not a match, or if it was a match but didn't consume any characters, then we will shift a new state and break. And if it is a match and we did consume some characters, we'll add however many characters we got to i and go for another iteration. After the inner loop, we'll just continue to the top of the outer while loop. And that's actually all the cases we need to handle. If anything else occurs, we'll just throw an error. Now, let's think about this for a second. If we made it all the way through all of our states successfully, calling shift on the queue will actually just return undefined. That will trigger the exit condition of this while loop, and we'll actually consider this a success. So at this point, we can just return an array with true as the first element and i as the second element indicating, of course, how many characters were consumed overall. This fully closes all of the recursion that might have occurred due to grouping and allows the test and the state matches string at index functions to interact properly. Now let's try this out. We'll create a regular expression string with a very simple expression. It will be the letter A zero or one times, the letter B exactly one time, and the letter C exactly one time. In order to pass the regex, we'll bring in the parser that we wrote earlier and create a set of states by passing our regular expression string. Of course, we're also going to need a string that our regular expression should match, so let's choose a really easy one, ABC. We'll get the result by calling test with our states and example string, and we'll console log out the result. And when we run this in the terminal, we see an array with true and three. So we did indeed match with our regular expression, and three characters of the input string were consumed. Let's try removing a from our example string, since it should be optional. Now we see another match, but this time we see only two characters. And of course, if we put a z at the beginning of the string, then the string should fail to match. Now let's do something a bit more complex. Uh, let's have exactly one a, and then a group with exactly one b, exactly one wildcard, uh, we'll match this group zero or more times, and then we'll have the letter C and the letter D. Our input string can be something like AB exclamation mark B dollar C D. And when we run that, we see a match with seven characters consumed. Removing B dollar should still yield a match and removing B exclamation mark should as well as the whole thing is optional. But if we remove the final D, then we shouldn't match, and we see that we don't. You might actually think that we're done now, but this implementation has a fundamental flaw. Let's go back to a very simple regular expression. Let's have exactly A, and then a wildcard, zero or more times, and then exactly the letter C. We'll make our input string A, C, C, and you might expect that to match. And indeed, if we try this on a website like regex101.com, we'll see that it does match. But if we try in our implementation, we'll see that it fails. And the reason is that we forgot to include one of the most important features of regular expressions, namely backtracking. So what exactly went wrong here? Well, we matched the letter A, and then we matched the letter C with our wildcard. But because it was a zero or more match, we kept going and we consumed the final C. And then we got end of input. And so the zero or more state was complete and we moved into a state where we needed to match exactly one of the letter C. But obviously we couldn't do that because we'd gotten to the end of input. If we go back to regex 101 for a minute, 
we can see on the right over here that we have a human readable breakdown of what each part of the regular expression means. And for the star quantifier, it states that it matches between zero and unlimited times, as many as possible, giving back as needed. That giving back as needed means that after a state such as this, where many characters can be matched, if a later state cannot match, we need to somehow backtrack giving back some of the characters in order to give this other state another chance of matching. So how can we go about adding this backtracking capability to our implementation? Well, the basic idea is that we're going to need to build up a stack as we move through the states consuming characters. The items of the stack will be objects, and they're going to symbolize whether or not we can backtrack to this point. First of all, we can add this stack to the top of our test function. Then we're going to need to revisit our switch statement in the while loop that runs through the state queue. In exactly one, if we don't match, then we're going to need to try and backtrack. We'll come back to this part and implement this in a moment, since it will make a little bit more sense when we understand how the objects in our backtracking data structure will look. If we did match, then we still need to move to the next state, but we also need to record this operation in the backtrack stack. The pieces of information that we need to keep track of are, is this state backtrackable? What state are we actually dealing with? And what steps were made? Or in other words, what did we consume along the way? In the case of a result obtained through exactly one, we need to say that this is not backtrackable. And that should make sense. You can't match a character or group exactly and then give some of it back. You've only got one and you needed exactly one. The second part, the state that we're dealing with, is just the current state, so we can reference that in our object. And lastly, we need to record what we consumed. Since some states consume multiple times, this is going to be an array. We consumed exactly once, and we can record exactly the number of characters that we consumed here. Everything else will be the same. For 0 or 1, we will push into the backtrack stack when we reach the end of input. Again, this isn't backtrackable because we consumed zero characters, and the state is just the current state. The consumptions array will just contain a zero. If it wasn't the end of input, then we'll also need to push into the backtrack stack. Whether or not this is backtrackable depends on whether or not we actually match something. If we did, and we consumed at least one character, then we consider this backtrackable, since we could give that one character back. Now, zero or more is the most interesting by far. Before the while loop, we'll set up an object which will be pushed later into the backtrack stack. We'll start out with a backtrackable value of true, the state is just a reference to the current state, and the consumptions will be an empty array. If we reach the end of input, and there are no items in the consumption array, then we have to consider this whole state unbacktrackable. In that case, we can just push a single zero into the consumptions. Before we break, we can actually push the backtracking object into the stack. Now, if we didn't end up matching, or we didn't consume any characters, again we need to perform the same check to determine whether or not the entire state is backtrackable or not. Again, we'll set the property, we'll push a zero, and we'll make sure to push the entire backtracking object before breaking out of the inner while loop. Otherwise, as well as adding how many characters were consumed to i, we'll also push that number into the consumptions array of our backtracking object. So at this point, we've built up a data structure that describes how we can backtrack if we get into a situation where we need to give back characters. Now we can actually implement the backtracking logic itself. So let's scroll back up to exactly one where there wasn't a match and see what we need to do. Right now, we're returning this failure when we can't match. Instead, we're going to try and backtrack. So we're going to be writing a function aptly named backtrack, and we're going to say that it modifies our backtrack stack, it modifies the index variable, uh, the current state, and the queue in order to perform backtracking. And it's going to return a boolean for whether or not we were able to backtrack. Since backtracking is going to mess with the i variable, let's keep track of our index before backtracking. Then we can actually call backtrack, which will tell us whether or not we were successful or not. If not, that will constitute a final failure, where we can return false with the original index. Otherwise, we should now be in a newly backtracked state, and we can just continue back to the top of the while loop.
Backtracking is basically like a kind of undo operation, where we're kind of going backwards in time until we can find a point that we can modify. From that point onwards, we'll try to go forwards again. So we need to make sure that we build back up the queue of states as we go. We'll make a variable called could backtrack and initially set it to false. We'll create another trusty while loop, iterating as long as we still have items in the backtrack stack. Every iteration, we're going to pop one of the backtracking objects off the stack and destruct it into its component properties. If this state is backtrackable, then we're going to need to give back one of the consumption steps. We'll check to see if there are any steps for us to unwind. If not, it's essentially the same as being unbacktrackable. We can shift the state back into the queue and continue back to the top of this while loop. If we do have consumed characters to give back, however, we can actually just pop that number of characters back into a variable and take them away from i, moving our index backwards in the string. There could still be more to give back from this state, so we'll push the data back into the stack, set the could backtrack variable to true, and break from this while loop. If the state is not backtrackable, we can unshift the state and move i backwards as many characters as this state consumed. Then we will continue back to the top of the while loop and try again with the next object in the backtrack stack. Eventually, we're going to have either processed all of the backtracking objects or we're going to have broken out of this loop because we were able to backtrack. In the second case, we will set the current state to be the next one in the queue. And at the end of the function, we will simply return if we were able to backtrack or not. And if we briefly scroll back down to where we called this function in the exactly one case, we'll see that when we couldn't backtrack, we would actually just return from test. But if we were able to, we should be able to continue trying to process states, and the new current state should have been set up properly by the backtrack function. Now, this has probably been quite a lot to take in, and you might have to pause or rewind the video a little bit to convince yourself that you understand this mechanism. And if you feel confident that what we've written here does make sense, then let's try to run our example from before, where we matched exactly A, a wildcard zero or more times, and then exactly C, with our example string of ACC. Now we can see that it does indeed match, with the index getting to the end of the string, and it should also work properly if we remove our middle C entirely from the input string, meaning that our zero or more times had to give everything back that it had. And of course, if we add a bunch of extra characters to the input string, that should also work. And with that, we've implemented the essence of a regular expression engine. This code, as usual, is available on GitHub, links in the description, and you might want to take that code and use it as a basis to implement even more features, like for instance, range matching, negation, laziness, different quantifiers, look ahead, or even look behind. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel, or at least sharing this video with a friend. And make sure to check out some of the other videos if you're interested in building up an understanding of lower level concepts by building things from scratch. Thank you so much to all of the patrons whose support makes these videos possible. That you value these videos enough to support the channel really means a lot to me, and it sort of helps to offset the many hours that go into writing, coding, animating, and editing every video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. The pieces of information that we need to keep track of are 